In several contexts in this class, we've talked about the concept of dynamic equilibrium. We saw it in phase changes, where evaporation and condensation, for example, are in equilibrium. We saw it in solubility, where at saturation, dissolution and precipitation rates are equal. We saw it in steps in a kinetic mechanism. We saw it in the formation of encounter complexes in solution. While this mental picture of the reaction proceeding in both the forward and backwards directions at equal speeds is quite useful on its own, we can make this picture much more quantitative, and thus much more useful, by digging in a bit deeper. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's start by looking at the gas phase reaction between hydrogen iodide molecules to produce diatomic hydrogen and diatomic iodide, which we discussed briefly in our lesson on elementary reactions. Remember that for an elementary reaction, collision theory lets us write down the rate law directly. Well, this reaction is reversible, and thus can produce a dynamic equilibrium. And we can write down the rate law for this reverse reaction as well. The primary characteristic of an equilibrium is that the forward and reverse rates are equal. Notice, though, that this expression is a combination of rate coefficients and concentrations of both products and reactants. Let's do some algebra to rearrange it a bit so that all of the constants are on the left and all of the concentrations are on the right. Let's think about this expression for a moment. Everything on the left is a constant, as long as we aren't futzing with the temperature. This means that the right-hand side is also a constant. Sure, the individual values of the concentrations may differ from situation to situation, but as long as the equilibrium is established, this particular ratio of concentrations has to be a constant. That's a pretty remarkable fact. It means that if I tell you the concentrations of H2 and I2, then you can calculate how much HI has to be there for the system to be at equilibrium. We call this quantity the equilibrium constant and notate it with a capital K to distinguish it from the lowercase k we use for rate constants. We will sometimes even put a subscript EQ for equilibrium beside it, or we may add a different subscript to distinguish different kinds of equilibrium constants. We'll get to the different types in a future lesson. The convention is that we always put the forward rate constant over the reverse rate constant, which means that the ratio of concentrations we end up with will have the products over the reactants, handled in exactly the same way we would for a rate law. So in this example, the concentration of B in the denominator is squared because B has a stoichiometric coefficient of 2, and the concentration of C in the numerator is likewise squared for the same reason. This is pretty straightforward for a single reversible elementary reaction, but surprisingly, it is just as straightforward for a multi-step equilibrium mechanism. Let's see why. For any multi-step mechanism to be in dynamic equilibrium, each step in the mechanism has to be in dynamic equilibrium by itself. Let's look at this example. When we add the reactions together to find the overall reaction and cancel the species on both sides of the equation, we find that species A is a catalyst, and C and E are intermediates. We know now how to write the equilibrium constant for reversible elementary steps, so let's do that for our two remaining steps. Now let's see what happens when we multiply all three of these equilibrium constants together. After canceling, we get a ratio of concentrations that is exactly what we would expect if we had treated the overall reaction as if it were an elementary reaction in dynamic equilibrium. This means that we can write down the equilibrium constant for any reaction that is in dynamic equilibrium in exactly the same way, regardless of whether that equilibrium is a single step or a long mechanism. A couple of other things to notice in this result. The intermediates don't appear anywhere in the equilibrium constant, despite the fact that they are constantly present as the reaction is happening. That's convenient. The same thing is true for the catalyst. So the presence of a catalyst may change how quickly the reaction reaches its equilibrium set of concentrations, but it has no effect at all on the ratio of concentrations once equilibrium has been reached. You may remember that for kinetics, we were able to express the rates of reactions either in terms of concentrations or in terms of partial pressures. The same thing is true for equilibrium constants. Starting with the ideal gas law and solving for concentration, we see that we can convert from concentration to pressure just by multiplying through by 1 over RT. We can plug in this expression for the concentration to our equilibrium constant, factor out the RTs, and we find that if we express the equilibrium constant in terms of partial pressures instead of concentrations, it still works. And we can convert between the two by multiplying by RT to a power that is the difference in the stoichiometric coefficients between the products and the reactants. One last detail. Let's think about states of matter for a moment. 
If we're dealing with gases, we can express the equilibrium constant either in terms of concentrations or in terms of partial pressures. If we're dealing with solutions, we express the equilibrium constant in terms of concentrations. But what do we do when one or more of the reactants or products are solids or liquids, perhaps as the solvent in a reaction? Well, let's think about a solid for a moment. Maybe sodium chloride, which has a density of 2.16 grams per cubic centimeter. Let's do some dimensional analysis to see if we can turn this into a concentration for our solid sodium chloride. We use the molar mass to change grams into moles. We convert from cubic centimeters to liters, and we have moles per liter, which is molarity. Solid sodium chloride is 37 molar. But notice that this is a constant. It doesn't change as we change anything else in the system. So let's just move it to the other side of the equation with the other constants and fold it into our equilibrium constant. That way, the only thing we have on the right are the things where the concentrations matter. And that's what we do in all these cases. The solids and liquids have constant concentrations, so we consider them to be folded into the equilibrium constant. We only include in our definition of the constants the concentrations or the pressures of the solutes and gases. We will have a lot more practice working with equilibrium constants in upcoming lessons, so focus at the moment on the general idea. Equilibrium constants are a way to quantify the amounts of reactants and products in a dynamic equilibrium. And because nearly everything in chemistry is a dynamic equilibrium, these equilibrium constants are about to become our most powerful tool for explaining and predicting reactions.